Welcome everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you, you are in the world. Welcome to today's uh, BIMREC webinar 20.0. Discover how to get it right with BIM data and identifying the commercial benefits of BIM. As for uh, what are you guys going to take away from today's session, well, during today's session you're going to discover what BIM means for an asset's life cycle. You're going to discover how to utilize BIM for comprehensive project efficiency. You're going to discover why BIM is helping you have much better control of an asset's product data. You're also going to learn how BIM can really work for you commercially. Today's session is going to be between 45 60 minutes long, it's going to be it's going to be split into two sections as normal. It's going to be the presentation followed by the Q and A towards the end. And I will be hosting, of course, along with Nick. As always, we do have a ton to get through, so we're going to move really quickly and, as I say, take questions towards the end of today's presentation. Now, at the very end of this today's session, once the once we finish the Q and As. The webinar has completely closed down. For those of you live on today's webinar, there will be a pop-up box which will appear. In that pop-up box, you will have a link for today's slides with Nick. You will have a link to register for future webinars. They'll also have two additional beneficial questions for you guys live on today's session. So, so make sure you stick around to the end. Uh, to receive that information. Now, if you would like a recording of today's session, links for the previous webinars, or to schedule a call via my online diary, again, please stay to the very end, and I'll show you exactly where to go and how to schedule that call. Welcome back to all you guys that have attended uh, various uh, webinars throughout the last couple of years. Uh, it's, gr it's great to have you back. These sessions have proven really popular with uh, experts like yourself. A lot of you have written papers um, and even have a couple of guys on today that have written books so uh, welcome welcome to you all uh, welcome back it's uh, it, it's great it's great to have you here I really do consider you guys leading experts in your field so I know if you can take away some information some key information from today's sessions and this the webinars that we have had over the last couple of years that uh, the industry as a whole is in for a treat now with the BIM webinar series being an open invitation series of events. Obviously, there's a new people who will have turned up today, so welcome to you guys as well. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Hassib. I'm the founder of the Open BIMREC webinar series. I'm also the managing director of BIMREC and AEC recruitment. BIMREC are the leading international BIM recruitment partner for both individuals and organizations who are really looking to win with BIM. Our passion is helping candidates, our clients, and the industry as a whole really overcome any obstacles that you may have throughout your entire BIM journey, whether, whether that's via these online educational workshops as we're doing now, or by providing the very best uh, BIM professionals to join your team from fresh graduates through to directors and partner level appointments. For those of you new to the BIMREC webinar series, I'm often asked, uh, why? Why have we put together this series of free online educational workshops? Well, whilst extensively surveying our candidates, clients, and the industry as we do on a regular basis, we discover that the industry still has a really long way to go with regards to BIM and all of its associated technologies. So I thought, what better way to help educate then bring BIM leaders directly to your desk or your mobile device, like we have today. As you guys know, uh, BIM is a journey. Some companies have had a real huge success, whilst for others it's been a real steep learning curve or they're yet to embark on this journey. So whatever our goal, whatever level you're at currently, is to really help you excel, helping ensure our candidates, clients, and the industry has access to world-class leaders who are experts in their field, which we certainly have today. I'm very proud and privileged today to announce we have Nick Tune with us. Uh, Nick is a leading internationally recognized BIM expert. He's a regular speaker on the, on the BIM scene uh, across the globe. Uh, Nick is the CEO of CoBuilder UK. 
He's a board member of Building Smart UK and also sits on the executive team of Building Smart International. Nick is going to be presenting today on how to get it right with BIM data and identifying the commercial benefits of BIM. With that said, I would now like to pass you over to Nick's tune. Can you see that now? Like yes, everybody? I can see it perfectly. Fantastic. So, our staff, any, any issues, um, by all means, um, chip in, uh, Barry, if there's any specifically oh, that's working or not working. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, by all means, any questions, pe people can post any questions, and which, which I will answer probably at the end of the, my presentation. Fantastic. Okay. Over to you, Nick. So, so yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you, Barry, for asking me to do this. You, I've been asked, given the brief, to talk about delivering data and the commercial benefits of BIM. And the commercial benefits I'm focusing on are on data and the exploitation of data in BIM. Um, I don't need to take uh, much time saying who I am, because Barry's done a good job of that. I used to uh, head up digital and data at BRE, Building Research Establishment, before moving over to set up CoBuilder in the UK about 10 months ago, and heavily involved in building smart. Um, quickly, why did I join CoBuilder? Well, they've been a leading light in Scandinavia, which is often seen as a bit of a benchmark for BIM adoption. Uh, so over Nor in Norway, they've been working with kind of over 5,000 uh, different clients and nearly all the manufacturers and all the major contractors all work with CoBuilder on basically on construction product data and the exploitation of construction product data. And most of the Building Smart Data Dictionary has been populated by CoBuilder, and that's how I met them. So when they said they were looking at moving just out of Norway, obviously I was interested in how to help people, how to help, how to help the industry lift information just up from PDFs into data, and how the industry can then start exploiting it. So that's, the, that's my real mission, specifically in the UK. So uh, I've used this slide uh, a number of times, but it's quite important. And from, from the slide you can see, I designed this and the idea of a lovely looking building that's nice and green and working collaboratively through the design period and using BIM objects in, in how I design. Um, but often, I end up with this. And uh, a building that looks nothing like as good as I originally had in mind with Kobe Carl, as he's known, uh, with a load of paper uh, about what it is I've actually constructed. Um, and the point of BIM, if you like, the value around BIM is to try to get away from this and to use data and information through the design period, not just in design, as I mentioned back here, even though we could do fantastic collaborative design, but actually in the construction phase and then using this information in the facilities management phase so that we actually get the full benefit across the life cycle of information and data. And what does Kobe Carl, or my facilities manager, receive at this moment in time? He receives, or she, a load of paper and PDFs, which are often put on a CD, um, and that has an O&M manual. And, and that's the state of the industry in lots of cases at the moment. And the one thing about, about BIM now is to actually get the information right through from the design, right through to the management piece, and to be able to use this information effectively. And this is how, Car this is how Kobe Carl uh, feels when he wants to replace something in his building. He feels obviously completely frustrated because he doesn't know what the product is, what the, what the product's properties are, where the product was purchased, and where it's located. So what I'm talking about is utilizing the data and the benefits thereof across the supply chain, as I've mentioned, but right through then to facilities management, asset management. So that when we've done it well, we can end up with this. We can end up with collaborative uh, supply chains where we're using the information in a collaborative design manner, but also in the construction. And then we can end up with smart buildings and the building I wanted that I first envisaged. Um, <clears throat> now, the... Uh, Lots of people have heard of BIM and building information modeling and the phrase often coined, uh, better information management. Uh, and that's what you know, I'm focusing on here and talking to people about is how do we use the information better. And within BIM level two, um, the building BIM is described around the information model. 
And the information model isn't just a geog uh, isn't just a graphical model. It's actually the data associated with that um, graphical representation, as well as we still have the documents, the PDFs, etc. So we're talking about what is the right information, what is the right data at the different stages of construction to hand over to make sure we deliver the correct, accurate information model. So how do we generate value from the data right through from, from first design to end of life and reuse, if you like? Many of you might have seen this, the McLeany curve uh, from Building Smart. And this is basically looking at the earlier in the design process we get it right, um, the, the easier it is to control costs and therefore to reduce costs when we need to make changes, as in doing a clash detection on a computer is far better. Uh, you save a lot more money than actually making uh, uh, remedial uh, actions when you've got a steel be uh, a pipe needing to go through a steel beam, for instance. Uh, and so the more you do up front in the design, the higher the chance of you is of saving saving money. And then what data associated with that then do I need through that design process? And, and there's different ways of looking at it, such as the LOD, um, and in the UK, there's the level of information and the level of definition that NBS have been working to, but what data do I need in my design phases from initial concept uh, design, LOD 100, right up to full um, uh, detailed design? And what data then, what, what's the benefit of that data? What data do I need? And what data should I share? And who should I share this data with? And thinking of that in the design phase, it's important to determine what are my data deliverables and my data requirements just at design. Um, and uh, some of that has been described within tools such as the MBS, um, the MBS design uh, tool, the MBS toolkit, to help us do that, to work out what, design, what data we need and when we need it through the design phase. Then, obviously, when we've worked that out, we can use collaborative environments. Uh, this is a, a bit of a plug <laughs> for, for uh, Autodesk 360, not, not really a planned plug, but, but just a nice image that I stole, nevertheless. So when we have the information, we have a platform, we have a collaborative data, uh, a CDE, um, or, you know, there's many CDEs out there, so we can now start sharing information collaboratively in standardized formats. But I'm not focusing on design, because a lot of the, the BIM industry has been, has been very much driven from architects, and, and I think in terms of where we are, the industry's gone very well in design communities in terms of how to use BIM in the design environment. What I'm really going to focus on for the rest of the session is really about the construction phase and the facilities management phase, a bit that's, if you like, the, the tail behind the, the, the animal, if you like. We've done great work of design. Now we need to start actually utilizing and making most of the data. So how do we generate value from the data in construction, not just about facilities management? And what data do you need to help you build more efficiently or, or, or cheaper? Now, one of those things is cost information, cost data, and what cost data do I need through the design and construction phase? And where do I need to get that data? What format do I need that data in? This is all information that needs to be um, within uh, not just the employer's information requirements, but needs to be within a BIM execution plan from the main contractor to his subcontractors of what data do I need and when do I need this data? So, for instance, you might need it classified, for instance, in something like uh, the new rules of measurement, NRM, one to three. <clears throat> and when do I need to exploit this information? The same then with environmental data. So, any of you who've worked trying to develop a Bream Excellent building know the problem trying to get all the information in the construction phase together around whether it's something like U values or something like global warming potential or anything else, or, or was it Bream A rated or B rated? At the moment, we're just taking this information off PDFs, but this is all data we need, the environmental people need to get at. How do we get this data easy? How do we easily get access to this data to help us, the environmental teams? As well as this, what about health and safety? We have health and safety requirements on us during construction to make sure we don't use products that have nasty chemicals in it uh, and many other uh, health and safety needs. So it's not just about the end point or design point. What data can we use? in the construction phase and how do we utilize that data. And then moving on to facilities management. Now, the amount of times, I think where the industry is at this moment in time, the industry is a bit like Toby Carl, as I showed earlier, where they have, they, they create an O&M manual that's made of PDFs that's often 
uh, pulled together at the end of a project. But then you have CAFM tools, and CAFM tools often require basic information. So we might want some information about the um, uh, so serial number, the manufacturer, um, stuff like the asset code, asset description. And often people will talk about from say four to seven types of property data that they may re require per product type. And at the moment in time in the industry, a lot of people are using O&M tools to collect PDFs and maybe then that tool or a different tool entered manually into a system such as this as you could see on my slide, teams often take the data out of a PDF or using something like a, um, a, a document like a, a, a 360 field document, for instance, and just take these basic, basic information. But what I'd say is, as an industry, we need to get using the data and uh, maximizing and utilizing it better. Because if I look at a window, for instance, a Windows hasn't got, you know, you don't just want, oh, what manufacturer is, is it and the serial number. There's a load of really useful information, such as reaction to fire, water tightness, dangerous substances, impact resistance, acoustic performance, thermal transmittance. And all this information, this rich data we already have, it sits with the manufacturers and it sits in their PDFs. So within their declaration of performance or assembly instructions or uh, EPD or safety data sheets, the data is already there. So why don't we actually utilize this data? Why don't we utilize it in the construction phase for the environmental guys, the health and safety guys, but also right through and the costing and the cost the QSs, but also right then through to the facilities management. Why do we only collect basic data to manage our building? If we want the inter if we want um, a f uh, future cities and BIM level three, we need to start collecting this data. This is the building blocks of smart information in BIM level three. So across the supply chain, what do I need? Well, as a contractor, I might have a COBE requirement on me, but I also want um, environmental health and safety cost data. As a BREAM auditor, I need these environmental data. The health and safety officer needs this data. Specifier, I need uh, uh, a designer. I need information on size and width and various other properties. Facilities manager. I need basic information, but what about the extra stuff? And as a client, what do I want as a client? And, and what, what do I need to be handed over for me um, to actually manage my asset? So it's more than just uh, PDFs and five bits of data for a CAFM tool, which is where 95% of the industry is today. Now, one thing we're working on, and we're working on with big clients, such as the Ministry of Justice and some large um, uh, contractors, such as Skanska, for instance, is actually trying to work out what are their minimum data requirements. So for all their projects, what types of products are there? And you can see IFC type products on this slide, you know, uh, such as you know, uh, wall, floors, windows, roofs, etc. And then what data do I want? Do I want to collect? So back to the point: fire rating, acoustic rating, thermal transmission, slip resistance, security rating. If you went back to the the, what I was talking about earlier in terms of just recording PDFs and four or five or seven bits of basic CAFM data, you, you're missing all this information. You're not capturing this information. What, what, where the industry is moving now is large clients such as the Ministry of Justice and the other large government clients will start moving on to this. If they are starting to say, no, we want more. We want specific data about specific products. And this is why we want this data. So for instance, they might well want acoustic ratings of wards or acoustic ratings of something else or slip resistance. And this now has to filter down to the rest of the construction industry, to the manufacturers and the, su the supply chain in terms of the subcontractors and contractors to start getting and recording this information. So the data, well, it's the DNA of a building is, is products. So that's what we're collecting is the product information, that product data. And where do we get this from? Now, at the moment, as I said, you either have them stuck in PDFs, or you might take some information off a PDF and manually put it into a spreadsheet like Kobe or just an Excel, or you might use a, uh, a, 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 a an iPad to go on site and to collect the really basic bits of information, such as you'd see here, this is example 360, such as serial number, tag, barcode. This is basic, again, CAFE information. And this isn't really going to provide us the data that the MOJ wants. 
<clears throat> so how do we get it? And this is what I'm working on at CoBuilder, is to help the industry access the, the products, the actual product data, the DNA. So the challenge at the moment is we have all this information. Manufacturers have all the information and all the data already. It just sits in PDFs. So it's unstructured, uh, unmachine re readable, uh, and inaccessible, in effect. And the solution, as the UK government has now found, is to actually take the data and make it into product data sheets. And the product data sheets are based on the product data template. So the manufacturer now makes their data um, available uh, in, in common formats. And the way to, to name this data is via um, the naming conventions that are used in the construction product regulations. Uh, and within the construction product regulations for a window, for instance, it has a specific name of, of calling something a solar factor or sound insulation or a U value. And your product will then have a specific value that it achieves against that, and then the units. So the manufacturers need to make their, their information available as data, and need to make this out there so that people can now start interrogating their data and using it instead of just pulling off PDFs. The one thing, the one thing then is we need to make sure this data is now interoperable. So it can actually be used in tools such as the, the FM tools that people use, but also output it to Kobe or Revit or Archicad or IFC. And that's what we're, that's the, the, the one of the things, GoBIM, that we're working with the industry, the manufacturing industry, to do. And I've coined the phrase, which a lot of people quite like, is setting the data free, as in taking the information, pulling it out of the PDFs and, and making it free for the industry to use. So, so what is a product data template? You'll be hearing more and more about this because of the government's a plan and the government's intervention to make PDT standardized and for, for people to use. Um, and what it basically is, is a master, a master product data template is all the information about your products that you would want to share, a manufacturer would want to share, such as a durability, a durability or thermal, or fire, or uh, it, the list can go on of properties that you have in PDS that you want to share. Um, and then once they've been made available, your clients, whether it's designers or the contractors, can collect this data from the manufacturers, aggregate the data together, and then to be able to, to output the as-built data. Now that will, can be for government BIM level two projects that has to be outputted in the COBE format, but it should also be outputted into models, so you have an as-built model in IFC or Navisworks or Revit or, or whatever else. But this data, as I mentioned, needs to be understandable. So we should always start with the standards that, are, that, are, that have been set, and that's under the construction product regulations. And we need to make sure they're available in all the different other naming conventions. And this is this thing about interoperability, and interoperability is key. So what we do at, Go Build, uh, at Co Builder is to map them the, from the standard name, standard terminology, for those individual product types, we then map it to different languages such as French, German, English, but map it to how it's called in IFC, how air tightness, for instance, is called in IFC, or in Kobe, or Revit, or Archicad, or Bentley, so that the data now becomes not just a fixed data sheet in Excel, this data is now um, can be pulled out in the different formats and language you need it in. So in the UK, we've been working with various partners um, Major, the major contractors um, such as Kia, such as um, Skanska, Wilma Dixon, um, Carillion, and then uh, major manufacturers such as Wiener Burger, Canal, Flipbrand, Asarab Loy, about how, how they structure their data, the manufacturers, and how the, major, how the contractors can now start taking this data from their supply chain uh, and utilizing it, so, so really making the most of it. So in regards to a product data sheet, if I can um, come down off this presentation, see if this works, and actually pull up um, something live, this is the GoBIM system that the manufacturer would use. And this then is logged in as a Wienerberger product. So Wienerberger would now have all their products available um, uh, that they have and that they sell. And then within the system, they can, they can have the documents associated with the products, but they can also view the, they can view the products or, or their customers can view the, the product data so that, the, so that then 
their customers can take the product data sheet that they have and utilize that sheet and be able to produce the, the COBE or the IFC or the Revit from, from the manufacturer's own data. <clears throat> so let's see if this happens and happens quickly. I'm sure technology has beaten me earlier, so if it works, great. If not, ah, fantastic. So now, for instance, the, the subcontractor, for instance, could look at the Wienerberger product, search for the different product properties they're interested in, such as electrical data, geometrical data, operation maintenance data, construction data, environmental data, and, and, and then pull out the, the information they need. They can also search for the documents associated with that product. If there's a BIM object, attach the BIM object for, uh, associated, and then distribute it out. So what Wienerberger here, for instance, is doing is, is based on a product data template, which you can see here. So there's geometric properties, operation, maintenance, construction data, performance properties. They can start to, and then I can look at other stuff, such as environmental properties. Well, there's not within that. Um, they can then start to then make this data available and interoperable for people to be able to export into the other systems. <clears throat> so let me pull back up the presentation. <clears throat> so as I as I showed a minute ago, the 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 um, clients the, their customers can come and find the properties they use, and they can select whether I want them in IFC or Revit or Archicad, or I want this specific properties, and come and actually remove them based on the product data template. And this is showing an epoxy resin from a VJT uh, company and their properties associated. So I've been talking about um, product data and how manufacturers now can get their data out there and get it interoperable so that people can come and search for it. Um, many manufacturers I speak to talk about BIM objects and have spent money on BIM objects. Um, now, what I'd say on that is, a BIM object is useful for two purposes. One, for a manufacturer, just as a marketing point to say to designers, well, if you want to use my product, you can, here's my product, and you can put it into a model. Or two, you have something, a product that's so specific that um, uh, there is no standard generic version. But the one thing I would say is there are generic versions within Revit, for instance, or Archicad that you can use, um, to, that designers will use, and many of them don't want specific in 3D objects. <clears throat> Most of them just want to attribute data. And this is the point of my talk. The likes of the major, the clients and the contractors aren't bothered about the 3D objects. What they're really bothered about is the actual data about the products that they're buying and installing. So I say to people, BIM objects sometimes have their place. They shouldn't be made for everything, so they're not needed for paint, they're not needed for, for types of sheeting, they're not needed for insulation or boards or many things. Because, of, because people don't model them to any level of de detail. But sometimes they are required for specific purposes or purely for, for marketing purposes. As I mentioned, interoperability of the data now is really key because we have different classification systems in UniClass and OmniClass and NRM and SFG20 and the list can go on and on and on. The way different proprietary software systems name things is different from Revit to Archicad to IFC. And if we do things all in our own way, as in I call a window uh, uh, one way and you call it something else, we'll never understand each other. So that's why I said always start with the, the standard naming that's in the standards, as in construction product regulation based standards. And then we use the Building Smart Data Dictionary as in GoBIM to map to all the different languages, uh, classifications, and the way they're named in proprietary systems. So. How then now do we get our data into the, the supply chain, into the, to the contractors and into the, the main contractors and then distribute it out to the as-built model and to the FM systems? So we collect the data. Now at the moment the data can be collected um, via manually entering it, which I talked about earlier as in taking off a PDF. But the better way is to make their data available um, via tools such as GoBIM. The data is then structured as the product data sheet that the actual um, client wants, which should be based within an employer's information requirement. 
And then you can check the data because now we've actually collected this information. We can now say, is this the right fire door? I wanted a fire door with a three hour rating. If you've got a fire door with a two hour rating, that's the wrong product. I want, I, you know, you've installed. And the tool we use to collect this is a tool called Product Exchange, which we use as a repository for all the product data sheets and the, product, the PDFs for a specific project, such as a hospital, where we pull all this information together. And then we can actually not just validate, but verify that the data in the as-built model is actually correct. Once we have all this data, we can then export it out to produce the as-built model and push it into Kobe and the FM systems. And as a workflow, we're trying to get away from just a nice design, as I talked about earlier, in terms of we could have a nice ISC model or Revit model with Kobe. But actually now, as an industry, instead of waiting for the end to build something and then collecting all the PDFs to make you know, an M manual, why don't we start taking this information through construction? So as soon as we purchase the product, let's take the data, let's take the PDFs and the data to create the as-built, the repository of all this data so we can create the as-built model. And this is what we do in our product exchange tool. Um, now, in places like Norway, where they're advanced in some ways, is when I go to a major merchant like a Travis Perkins or SIG or whoever else, when I buy the product, they instantly send me the, the PDFs about what I've bought and where they can, the product data sheets. So you can just collect this information through the, through the purchasing process to actually build up that repository of data. So through my build, I'm taking all the products that I'm using, that I'm installing, and I'm collecting all the data I need to which should have been set out in the employee's information requirement and the asset information requirement. I've now got this repository and I can export it to make the asset model. So an example here is of the product exchange system and this is for Carillion on a, on a test project with a school, Deaconsfield School. Is here they just, this is just for 98 product types from their O&M manual. But we collected the, the, the information from them and from that, we collected the PDFs, as I mentioned, that you would collect for an O&M manual, and the data, and made the product data sheets. And there you can see just a list of some of the manufacturers that have been collected for, on that project. So it looks like an O&M manual. But instead of just PDFs, we have the actual data, the data sheets as well as the, uh, as the, the PDFs. And then where, for instance, information is missing or PDFs aren't right, then symbols come up, such as there's a, a, a roadside signal, an exclamation mark saying this is the wrong product um, and, and you can contact the supply chain to make sure you get the right one. So we've now, to go through the system, we've now got the, um, the manufacturers sharing their data, making their data available in different formats. We're now using a tool such as Product Exchange to now start for the, the, the contractor to start collecting this data in the form that they want it in, so that within their repository they've now got PDFs and the product data sheet, we export that to the as-built models. So uh, one version we can have, for instance, is uh, our, our Revit plugin, but we've also got plugins for Archicad now and Navisworks, <coughs> as well as our different IFC ones, where the, 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 um, the model can be opened, and what, can ha what you can do then is link to Product Exchange, the repository of all the information, and directly to GoBIM, to find the product that you've actually purchased. So here on this image, it shows a Vika window based on the window within the Revit model. And what I've attributed now is that window to the, to, to the actual model. And you can see there, for instance, there is a hyperlink that comes in the URL, the URL bit of the Revit, <coughs> in Revit, and if I click on the, the URL, then what happens is it brings up the product data sheet of the Vika, that actual Vika product. Now, that's one way of doing it, by hyperlinking back to a database of the products, which is in Product Exchange. The other way is we actually embed the data into the model, and that can be embedded into Archicad or straight to IFC or, or Revit, etc. so that the properties are now embedded. So what you have is you don't just have a... Um, a 3D representation of the product. You have that, but that's a, as a generic window. But now you've attributed the actual window that you've installed, i.e. a Vico window, and the data that you specifically asked for. So an example could be here, where I've done it with a Wienerberger product. So if you look at the, the Revit model, there's the Wienerberger product that's been associated, the way it's been associated to a window, I should 
Um, it should obviously be a wall, but that doesn't matter for, for now, just for this conversation. But what you can see is the hyperlink. And when I click on the hyperlink, now comes up the data I needed about that product, um, such as the, the width, the compressive strength, the Kobe properties, the IFC properties. So that's now embedded within, within the model. And from that, then, you can obviously export this data out into Kobe. So now you have the not just the most basic information within the Kobe, but you can ex also export out the attributes about the individual. And that those attributes are important because for, if it's for a client like the Ministry of Justice, they want the attribute section filled in. They want to know such as the slip resistance or U value or the fire rating. They don't just want empty properties. So to, f to finish off before questions, my advice to, to, to you guys on the call, if you're a client, you need to set out what data you actually do want and when you want this data. So what da data do I need at the design phase, the construction phase, and the FM phase? And this needs to be clearly set out within the employee's information requirements so that the supply chain understands what they need, what they must deliver. And the client, um, and especially for facilities management, are asking for data up front that they can then utilize to manage their assets, their infrastructure or buildings effectively. For manufacturers, um, make sure you share data, not just PDFs. And if you're sharing data, then designers and the contractors will be drawn to you because they can easily access your data. You know, they just won't be finding, they just won't be taking your PDFs. You can actually make your data available. And if it's easy, if I need to get a window and I need specific properties, data properties about my window, well, if you can share that data with me and you can make it interoperable and I can easily access it, then I've got more chance of that actually being procured, not just put in design, but actually being purchased. So delight your customers by showing that you're thinking of them how products are used after they're purchased. So the other good thing about it is if you're sharing this data, if then when they go back in, instead of having to look through a load of PDFs and pieces of paper, they can actually go in and find the data that they need in the model or in Kobe, there's a far, far higher chance that you're going to get re-procured, re in other words, repurchased. So, right, I found this is a Vika whatever window, I'll go and buy that one again, or a Philips certain type of light, I'll purchase that light again because I've got the information about it. So reselling, as an industry, we need to start, we need to improve how we resell. And we need to make sure that Philip, the, the data's uh, up to date. And the other good point is if you're sharing data, you can actually track your data. Who's using your data? This is fantastic for your sales and marketing teams, not just in terms of a BIM object and seeing who's downloaded your BIM object. You never, if you download a BIM object, you never know whether it actually gets product, in, uh, gets installed. I was recently with a major contractor who, who, who I was looking at their model, which had a load of uh, brand manufactured BIM object sanitary wear. I said, so you're installing that manufacturer, are you? They said, no, we just like the model. It just looks good in our model. That's not much help for your sales or, or team. But if, for instance, they're taking your data, the odds are is they're actually going to use this data and actually install your product. So you can track what information people want and what, who's taking your information. So for specifiers, you need you know, better ways of communication, 3D, uh, 3D collaboration. I'm not going to dwell on that because I say that specifiers is, is another conversation and, and very well, um, uh, for designers, very well looked at. But for contractors, what I'd say for contractors, it's not just about um, the, 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 uh, FA, the, the PDFs and a minute a bit, of, a bit of FM. It's about actually working out what data you want in the construction phase to help you build more effectively and to help your whole team build better and then what data do I need to actually pass on to my facilities managers and clients to actually make their life much easier so that you're adding value to the to your clients by saying look here's the CAFM data but also here's a load of other properties that are really important to you that you can utilize and you need to make sure this data is done in open format such as IFC and Kobe and that it's easily accessible um, and uh, another important thing for contractors, start a project by getting a clear, make sure you work with your, with your clients to make sure you get clear data requirements from the EIR and the AAR. And for many contractors, what I've actually started suggesting is, because some of the EIRs are, are, are quite poor, is that if they don't know, if a client doesn't know what they want, have your own minimum data requirements like the Ministry of Justice have done, and do that as a suggestion so that you can actually go to the to the client and say, look, you might not be sure what to ask for, 
but we've thought about this long and hard. And here's our suggestions of the type of data we think you might want to collect against these product types. That way, by doing that, you're showing value to your client, but also it makes your life easier because you're used to collecting that data. So think about what data you're going to collect and how you're going to do it, and think about how you're going to collect it from the supply chain. I've talked about using GoBIM for getting manufacturer's data and using Product Exchange to use as a repository to collect all the data from the supply chain. Um, and, and then you can then actually output the as-built models. <clears throat> so uh, that should be, I've come up to about uh, quarter to uh, six. So hopefully that's given you uh, a quick run through of product data and potential benefits and utilizations of it. I'm now happy to go over to um, the, the questions and answers and, and answer any specific questions people have for me. Fantastic. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks ever so much. Uh, first off, um, what's, the best, what's the best contact details for you? You do have your slide there towards the end there. If you want to stick that yep. up again so people know how to best get in contact with you. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Right. So, so my email address is tune at, uh, well, that's the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my email address is um, come now, tune at cobuilder.com. My phone number is 07471 947 346. Um, and Twitter is uh, nick underscore tune. And I think they're the main ways of getting in contact. Fantastic. I know you're a very, very busy guy, Nick. Is it best to send you an email first and then come back on the email? Or yeah, yeah. By all means, email. You can email me or phone. People interested, I don't mind. Email or phone and, and I'll deal as much as I, as I can, but um, by all means, get in contact. Super. Well, well thank you. Um, a few questions have come in. I've been looking at your... Well, first off, I need to uh, apologize. Whilst, whilst listening to you, I've been looking at some questions that did come in uh, prior to the uh, prior to today's session, and in all fairness, Nick, it seems though most of them have been asked uh, throughout the past presentation. So thanks for covering those. Uh, however, uh, a few have come in as well. Um, are you fine now to to crack on with the question? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Fantastic. Okay. I'm happy to. Do you want me to? Do you want to fire the questions to yeah, me? Yeah, I'll fire the questions at you. It makes it easier. Yeah, good I, idea. As I said, I yep. think I think everything, pretty much everything, has been covered on. Um, on the previous questions prior to the webinar, so I'm just going to, uh, if I can, just come straight at you with some questions coming from. Fantastic. Okay, so questions coming from Andy. Hi, Andy. First of all, um, if as-built data is exported back into say, a consultant's model, how is data ownership managed? If as-built data is put into, sorry, back into which model? Back into, you say, a consultant's model. How is the data own, ownership managed? Now, that's a very good question. Um, so lots of contractors don't want, to, to, lots of contractors, designers don't want to do that. Sure. So one option is, is to take on that liability, for sure, um, but many don't want to push it back. For instance, if something's designed in Revit, often they don't want to push it back into Revit you might want to push it into a federated model, such as a federated IFC model or uh, Navisworks, in which case from Navisworks you could still export an IFC. So what my recommendation is, is that you use the design model to make the first federated model, and then you're supplementing the actual information in terms of what gets used and what gets constructed um, from the data, and then you start attributing the data, like I showed you with the Vico window, into to the middle, to the model, so you have an as-built model that you as a contractor has a level of ownership based on. So the client in effect would, can, can still receive the designer's model, yeah. but that's not the as-built model. You as a contractor attributes the data into, say, a Navis Works or IFC and, and actually uses that as the, the as-built model. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions coming from Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, it would be useful to capture where this information must sit within the model. Do you share the where the Excuse me, apologies. I'll just uh, make this bigger. My eyes are my eyes are stretching. Um, where was I? It'd be so. It'd be useful to capture where this information must sit within the model. Do you share the where? Do you share where the data will exactly sit if embed within the model? Data validation processes can then be set up to check this. Is is this correct? Yes. 
right? Yes. So, <laughs> so, so what you can, what we're doing is you ex we can export the information into an IFC viewer. So your actual, so then you've attributed the data about your product, such as the Vico window, into the model, <clears throat> and then from that you could use a tool like Salubri Model Checker to then check to make sure that is you make sure that's in the right place uh, within you know with you can do the rule check to make sure that's actually in the right location. From that then is then what I'd suggest you do a Kobe export because then you'd export the actual as built data with the zones and locations of the actual place. So yeah, that's so that's exactly what you do. You attribute the data into the model, <coughs> yeah. and that can then be checked and verified. Fantastic. Okay, fine. thank you. Uh, Jordan's asked a question. In your opinion. Well, how long will it take to standardize some of these processes across Europe to the point that all of the manufacturers are submitting their product data this way? Uh, a good question. Um, <laughs> pluck, pluck and so the sky, yeah? There's something called the Building Smart, something called the Building Smart Data Dictionary, and, and we are using that as the basis. And the UK government has gone out and, and we're starting working with BRE to make product data templates for the UK. We've offered to work with BRE to help put them then into the BSDD so that they can then be mapped to different languages because I mentioned language being a problem, but also other different naming conventions. But if everybody starts by naming things by the standards, by construction product regulations, then we've got a good starting point because if you've got a window, it will have to be tested against construction product regulations and it's all named in specific ways. So at least that's a starting point for Europe. You know, the whole of Europe tests a window the same way or tests whatever else it might be, a brick or whatever else. So the starting point is to go with the standards, use them as, uh, as, as much as possible. Then the UK has a program now to look at non-word terminology that's not in standards and to agree that there's actually, actually there's going to be an actual process developed with BRE and uh, the BIM4 groups to actually help move that forward with, with other um, institutions. Then from that then we put that into the Building Smart Data Dictionary and if it needs to be mapped to something else then it can be. So standards and then mapping through the BSDT and that's why the fact we do it, Go, the GoBIM tool does all that for the manufacturer so that it makes their data interoperable. Sure, okay fantastic. Uh, let me have a look on the, on the sheet here. Oh, um, I think you may have just start, answered this earlier actually. Can Coded Builder be used as a conduit for subcontractors and manufacturers? to share information with the main contract and design on a live project to be subsequently pushed into the model. Did you yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah. the point of it. Yeah. Um, but, but it's an interesting, I can reiterate a point though, Thank because you. at this moment in time, I, the sub, what do the subcontractors have to do on BIM? They don't need to buy a load of Revit models and spend money on BIM. What they need to do is just provide information as in a, a manufacturer's product. So if I'm a subcontractor, what product have I purchased and how can that then, uh, how can I get that information to the main contractor? Now at the moment that's done via PDFs and it's done at the end of the project which is right. the no way of doing it for the future. You need to start collecting this information now and start collecting the data. So how does the subcontractors collect this? Now lots of people are talking about giving the subcontractors a load of data sheets, product data, te sorry, product data templates which they then have to populate. That's going to take them so much time and effort and cause them so much hassle. That's why we're saying if the manufacturers get make their data freely available, yeah. if I'm a subcontractor and I go and buy a specific window, I can then just say what data I want in the yeah. tool like GoBIM and, and out it pops. Instead yeah. of me then, if I'm installing windows, I then have to sit down with a PDT and, and write in all the information, which is a laborious process. So we need to get away from PDFs. We need to get data out there. But really, we need the manufacturers to share the data so the subcontractors and the contractors can make it easy to collect it. Sure. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I'll just go through these now. Bear with me. How does asset codes benefit the application of BIM in the commercial sector? You've touched on that, haven't you? How does asset uh, codes benefit the application of BIM in the, in the commercial sector? Asset codes? Sorry? Uh, yeah, that's what it is. How does asset codes benefit the application of BIM in the commercial sector? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by yeah, nice. by codes. There are there, there's different classifications, such as SFG20, for instance, and you'd map to that to that specific code, and you'd use that. But the commercial question is a good one, because yeah. if it's not government clients, what information do they need? Sure. And we need as an in, we need as an industry to start pushing the private sector to see the benefits of this data, what they can do with it, instead of back to this point, 
five bits of FM data and a load of PDFs. <laughs> so I think that for the private sector, we may be starting with the public in terms of where BIM's going, but we need to show across to the FM companies and, and the private estate owners what benefit they can derive from it. Sure. Okay, I'll just go through these now. Uh, what non geometric data must be kept with the geometrical model and what can be left separate downstream and how do you structure your design team to get the highest quality non-geometric data into your project? So, so again, that's very much what I've been talking about. Yeah, the the, the non-geometric data is vital and that's the bit that the contractors and the uh, uh, clients want more than the geometrical because the geometrical can be used, as I said, it can be used as uh, generic information. But what data you collect needs to be set out in employee information requirements and an asset information requirement in level two, as I mentioned. And I showed the slide earlier from the Ministry of Justice saying this is the type of data that, that we need. So, so that needs to be set out so the supply chain understands what data and information they need to get. Now, you have a choice then. What we do in product exchange is collect, if you like, have a repository now of all this data that comes in from the manufacturers, yeah. either via extracting it off a PDF or a subcontractor filling it in on, the, on, on a, a PDT, on an Excel, or taking it directly from the manufacturer via a tool like GoBIM. Yeah. Then you've got the choice then in the ASML model, do you hyperlink or do you put little bits of information and data into the model? You know, the choice is yours in, how, in terms of how rich data you want to put into the ASML model. Uh, put the, all the PDF data into it or just link it all, or put certain properties like just Revit parameters, for instance. That, that needs to be determined by the supply chain and probably needs to be set out within the BIM execution plan sure. and probably should have been set out in the EIR. Yeah. And as I said before, I think where an EIR is poor, which is 90% of the time yeah. or 95% yeah. of the time, my suggestion is the contract and the supply chain needs, and including the designers, need to make suggestions of the data that, that they suggest to collect through the through the design and construction handover process and then set out how they're going to collect that. Okay, no, well, fantastic. Um, thank you, Nick, again. Uh, I think we can uh, wrap it up there. Unless anybody's got any more questions, if you've got any more questions, the box is open. Um, I appreciate your time, Nick, and I know a lot of other people do as well. Um, yeah, no, so thank you. Um, if I could just take the screen as well so I could show information of... Uh, what's coming up on, yes. on our next session? Thank you, Nick. Again, thank you as well. Yeah, let me just let me um, if I can uh, find the screen. Yeah, no worries. Go away. Oops, not doing it. Where's the sky? There it is. It's <laughs> online. We are having a uh, difficulty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Long stop, uh, actually, for the pair of us. Brilliant. Yeah, have you got it? Second. Yeah, I've got it now. Uh, yeah, no, so uh, thanks again to Nick. Um, thank you as well, everybody, for attending today's session. Um, our next webinar, um, <laughs> the chat that was going to do it is away on holiday, so um, it was going to happen on the 18th, so we are yet to confirm. However, uh, there's a few speakers that I've got lined up, and they're going to be between the 18th or the 24th of May, as I say. The dates are to be confirmed. Um, now, after this session, um, once the webinar, as I was speaking about in the beginning of today's session, once it has completely shut down, there'll be a link for next slides for the day. Apologies for not being able to get them to you earlier. Um, you'll be also be uh, put in for registration for all the future and upcoming webinars. There's a couple of questions in there as well. Um, and if my team, if my team and I can help, uh, either you personally or your team uh, with any uh, recruitment requirements. If you're looking for anybody specialist, please don't hesitate to uh, drop me a line uh, or schedule a call via my online diary. My online diary is bimrick.com forward slash diary. There's my email address. Um, with that said, I look forward to welcoming everybody to the next session. Um, again, thank you, Nick. I'm not sure if you have anything else that you'd like to add. No, nope, that's absolutely fine. By all means, if people have more questions or interest, yeah. as I mentioned, uh, they can, it's on the slides, just tweet me Q. or email me or phone me or whatever else. Tunatcobuilder.co.uk? Dot com. Dot com, thank you. No, Tunatcobuilder.com. Fantastic. All right, well, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks again, Nick. Uh, thanks again for everybody for attending. I look forward to welcoming you to a future session.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Cheers, Nick. Bye. Bye-bye.